Welcome to MindShift, I'm Brandon, and today is another Sunday video. Now, typically on Sundays, we don't react to any videos, although this one is going to be a bit different. Most of the time, Sundays are for topics like free will or slavery or prayer or faith or deconversion help, like how to get over your fear of hell or how to come out as an atheist. But today we're gonna look at 10 questions posed by Braxton Hunter of Trinity Radio for the atheist. Now, I found out about this video by watching The Non-Alchemist, and I'll link him down below, and I'd encourage everyone after this video to go check him out. He has some really amazing videos, and I begin to watch him answer these and then I stopped and I said hey I actually want to answer these that first question alone is so fascinating my guess is we might have some really similar answers because so far I've seen a lot of similarities in how we think and how we tackle these subjects I also noticed that his video was a little bit shorter so I think that he really prepped for this and he was probably more precise than what I'm going to be I haven't seen the other eight questions here we're gonna be doing them off of the cuff and being that it's a Sunday video I think we'll take a little bit more time with it let's start by playing Braxton's intro to his 10 questions and see what this video is gonna be all about the world viewed discussions space can be so combative. And when atheists and Christians come up with lists of questions that they don't think the other side can answer, those questions usually aren't genuine. I've never made a list like that, although I've responded to some. Here, I hope my atheist interlocutors will consider these questions deeply without giving glib answers. These aren't meant to be gotcha questions, though I'm not asking for no reason. I expect you will have answers, and I want to hear what the most sincere among you have to say. With that, here are my 10 questions for atheists. Well, I'm excited. We have our marching orders. Let's try not to give any glib answers. I think I'm qualified to answer these questions, being that I would consider myself a sincere atheist, whatever that means. I think the very fact he added the modifier sincere makes me a little hesitant here about what's coming. Hopefully there aren't any gotcha questions, but let's find out. Let's play question number one. Now, I noticed that the non-alchemist for this only played the actual question and none of the explanation to the question that Braxton was giving. I'm going to take a little bit more time and play the question in its entirety. At least for this first one, because I think that it has a lot to do with how I'm going to answer the question. What facts about reality that you and I agree are real facts about the way the world is, does your worldview account for, but my Christianity doesn't account for, or at least doesn't account for well? And for those of you that would point out atheism isn't a worldview, I'm talking about you, your worldview that includes atheism. I can't think of any. Christianity accounts for evil, suffering, the existence of other religions, including supernatural events in those other religions, science, and differences among different denominations of Christianity. But I can think of many things that the most common worldviews that include atheism don't answer as well as I think Christianity does. Like universal supernatural claims, universal religious experiences, free will, morality, near-death experiences, beauty, the rapid expansion of the early church, the events surrounding the life and death of Jesus of Nazareth, and our shared longing for purpose and meaning. So what is it that Christianity Christianity doesn't answer as well as your worldview. What a question. Now, again, I only saw the first one or two, so I knew of this one. I don't know what the other eight are going to be. I wonder if they're going to be as packed as this. I feel like we could take an entire video to unpack this. There's three things that are standing out to me right off the bat. One, he's saying that there are facts, that both sides can agree are facts, and then wanting to look at the difference with how the worldview interprets those facts or has an answer for those facts, etc. The problem here is he started listing things that I don't think are facts. He's talking about universal spiritual experience and things like beauty. So I want to be careful there. The second thing is he's saying he doesn't see anything that the atheist in their worldview, and he was careful to say that atheism is not a worldview, but as an individual, what is my worldview? But he's saying there's nothing I can explain that Christianity can't. And then he goes on to say there's a ton of stuff that the Christian worldview or the believer's worldview can answer where an atheist is just left holding the bag. So I'm going to try not to be pedantic and get stuck in the semantics here, but I want to answer this as precisely as possible, not glib. The first thing I would say is that Christianity being able to come up with an explanation that meets everything factually that the secular side has already found out is not impressive to me. This is not something that is special. I'm sure they have an answer for all of these things. The difference is they have had to modify their answers based off of what the science has found. They have made many guesses that have been incorrect until science has found it, and then they just move the goalpost, saying, yes, it was figurative all along. Of course, we know that evolution 
evolution is true. This brings me to another problem. I can't compare my worldview against the Christian worldview because there isn't a cohesive Christian worldview. I think that's a huge problem for this. Who am I talking to? Am I talking to a fundamentalist? Because then I would say, well, your worldview does not allow for the fact of evolution. Or am I talking to a progressive Christian, which says, oh yeah, evolution is true. The earth is four and a half billion years old, but God still created it. In which case they have moved the goalpost from early Christianity, who thought the earth was flat, who thought the earth was literally 6,000 years old and has come up with an answer so that there is no separation here between a Christian worldview and an atheistic worldview about this particular fact of evolution. So again, I can see so many arguments coming back from so many sides because I would just say, well, evolution for one. Again, you can talk out of both sides of your mouth here if you're the Christian. You can be the fundamentalist that says, I don't agree that evolution is a fact. Therefore, we don't disagree on any facts that we both agree on. Like by putting the modifier that there's facts we already agree on and then how are those explained differently by the different worldviews? I think that this question is just difficult in general. Like we could spend a lot of time just on scientific things here, like an understanding of the universe or the order of creation. The fact stars weren't created before light and before people makes no sense if we're taking the order of creation seriously. So I don't think that the Christian worldview can answer on its own from a biblical standpoint how we got here, how the universe really works. Even the very fact that I mentioned earlier that we revolve around the sun is something that early Christianity did not think and did not accept until much much, much later, after tons of pushback and it becoming objectively true and measurable that this is indeed the case. According to the Christian Bible, the sun moved around us and it even stopped. This is not true and would be catastrophic. I also think that the Christian standpoint, if I'm going to try to give a few more answers, although I would just give it a bucketed answer of everything we've learned about science, that at one time until Christians started getting more flexible and moving the goalpost, disagreed with the clear belief of the individuals who wrote the Bible and what they knew about the world at that time. But some other ones might be the problem of evil. Does the Bible, does the Christian worldview address the problem of evil? It absolutely does, but not to the extent that I think my worldview does. I see evil, and evil is already kind of a heavy-handed word, suffering, the state of something being less beneficial as a natural outcome of a species that evolved originally selfishly before having to work together so carefully in society and having these base, I have to take care of me, I have to propagate and pass on my genes first at all cost. We wouldn't be here if we came from a lineage of people that were just willing to throw themselves off a cliff willy-nilly. We had to look out for ourselves First, it was those kinds of people that by natural selection had the best chance of passing on their genes. Saying it's because there was some cursed tree in a garden that some talking snake tricked some woman into eating and that that ushered in sin, this invisible concept of missing the mark or doing something that doesn't align with God's desire, which is also not objectively discernible as God's nature seems to be contradicting within the text and ever changing, even though another claim of his is immutability. I think that we could talk about all all those kinds of moral issues in addition to the scientific issues with a worldview that I can say this makes sense. I understand a subjective morality that everyone has, how societies needed to be able to work together and how people that didn't fall within the certain concepts of not taking things from other people because it would break down the system or killing people unnecessarily because then you'd be afraid they'd kill you back, etc. Like those things make sense that we established law and order and that as we got in bigger and bigger societies, we got more and more help in establishing those laws and keeping that order. And we have the morality system that we see today. Now, this isn't a video to talk about objective versus subjective morality, but that is something that I think the Bible is taking a shortcut on. I'd love to be having this as more of a conversation with Braxton because I don't know if I'm understanding the question correct based off the kinds of answers that he's giving. He's saying that Christianity accounts for things like other religions and supernatural events within those religions. I am not sure that Christianity accounts for those things. Christianity claims over and over that there's only one true God and that that God has revealed himself through his creation. So how are we worshiping so many other deities throughout history, both before and after this God was on the scene that aren't this God? How did we get it wrong? How do these tribes that are isolated, that should have general revelation of Yahweh and the name of Jesus Christ, end up worshiping some rock God or sun God? I actually think the fact that there's so many religions in general is problematic to the Christian worldview. Yet, 
that alone the 10,000 or 45,000 or whatever it is sects of Christianity. I don't think Christianity can answer for that. If there's one true God with one true Bible with one true message and we have the witness of the Holy Spirit and there's only one way to salvation, etc. How do we have 10,000 different iterations and probably more than that, probably a couple billion because it's so highly individual to everyone in their subjective experience and their subjective interpretation of their subjective prayer time and quiet time with the Lord and the unique friendships and pastors and spiritual experiences that they claim they have had that I don't think anyone can fully agree on an expectation of this proper religion. I can account from that for my atheistic worldview that when there's not an objective source of truth and you take something as complicated, contradictory, and convoluted as the Bible, you're going to have different iterations of it at exponential values. That all makes sense for a man-made religion where everyone is just trying to guess and apply their own subjective nature to it. That's exactly what I would expect. If you're honest with yourself as a Christian and you really believe there's only one God, God, and only one correct interpretation of these things like communion and salvation and baptism, etc., and that you have a God who is not the author of confusion and who did want us to know these things, then that's problematic. So I don't know if I'm answering this question to Braxton's delight or expectation, but those are my thoughts off of hearing the question. So Braxton, I'm sure I'm not on your radar, but if you want to have me answer these questions more precisely according to what you were asking, I'd love to go back and forth with you to make sure I'm honing in on the right things. Let's move on to question two. If your definition of a atheism is merely that it's a lack of belief in God and you're just waiting to be convinced. But then you speak of him as though he's in some way synonymous with Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, or fairies. Doesn't that at least send the message to your listeners that you actually believe that there is no God? After all, these are entities and beings that you likely believe do not exist. And if your response is that you merely lack a belief in Santa Claus and don't actively believe that he does not exist, doesn't that sound a little disingenuous, honestly? It's an interesting question. I don't think it's disingenuous, by the way, to say I lack a belief in Santa Claus. If you had to ask me to bet on it, I would bet he does not exist. That's different than saying I believe that he does not exist. We use the examples of Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy to help explain to the theist who cannot wrap their head around this concept just how unlikely it is to us that this God would exist. And I would turn it back on someone like Braxton and say, do you just have a lack of belief in Allah or do you believe that Allah does not exist? He'd probably go as far as to say he believes Allah does not exist because of his belief in his God who says that he is the only God. I think it's not even an important distinction here that he's trying to make. I would say that agnosticism does align better with some of these terms that some atheists try to use sometimes. Agnosticism being that we just don't know or sometimes can't know and will not make any kind of a claim. I'm very agnostic about the potential for this world to be something that is created. I don't believe there's anything inherently impossible about there being a supernatural power that I am unaware of and that had the power to create this. It might even have a natural explanation down the road as we learn more, and we would just consider it to be supernatural now. But I'm atheistic if we're going to be more specific in the Abrahamic God. It is such that I have such a lack of belief in this God, not only because of the lack of evidence, but because of what I believe to be some of the positive evidence that we don't have this God, like issues within the Bible that make the Bible be called into question for its validity and if the Bible is not a valid source of divine truth, then I have no reason to believe the Bible's claims that solve some of the other issues. So I'm willing to go on record to say that I believe that the Abrahamic God does not exist. I can be wrong about that belief, which is why I would prefer to say I just have a lack of belief. Belief doesn't have to equal certainty. If you asked me how certain I was, I doubt I'd ever say I'm 100% certain Yahweh doesn't exist. I'd have to leave some room for error or I think that that's what is disingenuous. And I also think the Christian who says, I'm a hundred percent sure that God is true. Really? A hundred percent? Then what do you need faith for? So I don't know. I, I guess I don't understand the importance of this question. It does feel a bit like a gotcha question that atheists are somehow manipulating words. Like this is the definition of atheism, my guy. I don't know what to tell you. Like it's a lack of belief. I don't know, but I don't have good enough reasons to believe the claims that have been made to ever say that I do know. And in lack of being able to say that I do know, or I do believe, or I'm 
willing to just rely on faith, I am left with my atheistic stance. So to wrap that up, I would say it just becomes a case of probability. When atheism becomes a part of someone's worldview, they typically change their positions on other issues like abortion, sexual morality, and a number of other things. I actually have several videos of well-known atheists saying that there's nothing wrong with prostitution, that they hope their children don't save themselves until marriage, and that sex workers should be put up on a pedestal no different than the military. But even if you didn't become an atheist just so you could sin, and I believe you, do you at least understand why those moves could send that message to people who might say that to you? Uh, yeah. I guess I could understand why sometimes some people could say that about some atheists. If you're a Christian your whole life, and then the same week you no longer profess a belief in Jesus, your actions change dramatically into something that is a more clear-cut version of morals changing, like you go on a killing spree, you cheat on your wife for the first time, and you rob a bank, it can seem like, yeah, maybe Christianity was the only thing keeping you from sinning, and now that you don't believe, you wanted to be handed over to your sin. Sure. I think in general, that whole thing is ridiculous. I think people don't do that. I think that there is a natural explanation for someone that is waking up from this system that controlled and told them what morality was, that when you lose the source material for those claims and you reevaluate on your own nature, you come out with some different ideas. I'm an example of this in some part, not in all of these things. And so again, grouping this together, I think is ridiculous. Like, oh, once someone deconverts, they automatically become pro everything that were formerly against. That's not true at all. I'm pretty darn conservative for an atheist. I'm also way more liberal on a few things I used to be conservative on because some of my conservative views were based on biblical rhetoric that I no longer believe is valid. So my perfect example is I believe 100% now there is nothing wrong with being homosexual. I believe they should have the exact same rights. I think they should be able to marry in the way that secular straight people can marry. Does this benefit me somehow? Is this me leaving the church because I wanted to sin? Nope, I'm straight. I just no longer have anything against people of different sexual preferences because I never should have. This is so clear to me, like the fact that Christians think their morality is the only morality. And so therefore, when someone is no longer a Christian and they start embracing, accepting, or defending some things, not everything that they've just completely gone off the deep end and they're open to all bad things. Again, how many atheists become an atheist and then just go start raping and killing? Like none. Give me some examples here. And he's saying he has Christian friends who now are saying that they want their kids to be promiscuous before marriage. I don't know if that's what someone says. I think that's a pretty strange thing to say. I don't necessarily want my kids to be promiscuous, but I'm also not going to be devastated and think that their sexual soul is in jeopardy if they have premarital sex. I think there's some good scientific data on the likely success rate of a marriage based off how many partners you have, as well as other factors like living together, etc. And I want to give my kids the best chance for success and happiness. So if one of their goals is to have a lifelong partner of any kind, I would hope to show them as much data as possible about the most beneficial decisions they can be making. Where I'm not going to encourage them to get that information from is an ancient Bible that treated women as less than and stoned homosexuals to death. There's a middle ground here. I think it's just so silly to think like this. So responsibly, I would say, no, I don't understand when Christians just think we want to sin. It doesn't make sense on any level. But if you're going to give me a very specific example about one atheist doing one complete 180 on everything he ever believed just because he left the faith, sure, I'll give you that one. If it's a lack of belief sort of atheism, what is it? Is it 50-50, 60-40, 75-25? And at what point do you feel disingenuous saying that you merely lack a belief as opposed to leaning towards I believe that God does not exist. Okay, maybe this one will allow me to clarify. I think it was the second question better. Is there a possibility for a God that we haven't addressed yet or that created us and moved on or that we're in a simulation or that we're in AI or that we're a brain in the vat or that the universe itself is the life force? What, like whatever, I just don't know and I'm fine not knowing. So I don't think it's disingenuous to say I have a lack of belief. I do. My lack of belief is so strong and there is so much evidence for it that in some cases, I can feel like I can go further and say, I don't believe. And that's not disingenuous either. Dan Barker says this best when he talks about the married 
bachelor. If someone told you there's a married bachelor, would you say, well, I just lack enough belief in that concept? Or would you say that concept can't be true because of the law of non-contradiction? You'd say the second. You'd say there's no such thing as a married bachelor. Well, I'm saying there's no such thing as a moral God who is all benevolent, all knowing, and all powerful that created this world, that wrote or inspired the Bible, which describes so many immoral, unknowing, and non-powerful acts by this God. That's a married bachelor. And married bachelors can't exist. Again, I think I could be wrong. I'd put my percentage on the Abrahamic God well up in the high 90s if I were making a bet. But in terms of theism in general, and not even the theism of like the earth and what we've come up with, but just the option that maybe there is a higher power that created us, who knows? I don't even, I wouldn't, 50-50? I don't, I don't know. This whole channel to me is mainly about the religion I left that I believe to not be correct. And I feel I can speak on that much stronger than I can speak on. I, I wouldn't ever be one of those hard A atheists who says, there is no God. There can't be a God. What a foolish thing to say. Who knows? No good reason to believe in one thus far. Definitely no good reason to believe in this specific one. Now, I know we've all got our talking points, but I want you to struggle to be as sincere with yourself as you can right now. Doesn't it bother you a little bit that when we come to talk about the origins of the universe, and if there's a multiverse, the origin of that too, that the only real options you've got besides God is a past infinite universe, which is impossible, or the universe coming to exist uncaused out of nothing, or something far less clear than even those. It seems that for any worldview that includes atheism, there's a massive blind spot when it comes to the origin of the universe. And all the attempts to try and circumvent that problem seem desperate and at least far less likely than theism. My question isn't just what do you typically say about this, because I'm well aware of the responses. My question is simply this. When you step away from the debate mode that it's so easy for us all to get into online, doesn't this issue destabilize you a little bit? It seems to fit really poorly with any worldview that includes atheism. That's so interesting. I really believe that the believer doesn't see themselves at all in this same camp. Like, if your God doesn't exist, you're defining exactly this. And all the attempts to try and circumvent that problem seem desperate. It seems desperate. Creating a God that is this controversial, that has led to this much fighting, that has so much disagreement even among those who believe in him, and giving him all the required properties to be able to get yourself out of this issue. Oh, we'll just make him outside of space and time then, if the only thing that can create space and time is something spaceless and timeless. That's desperate. You created something that by definition would have been impossible to create what is here and now. This is like the blind watchmaker to me. Why not just attribute this this to the universe then. I'm not saying the universe did this. I'm not saying it's conscious. I'm not saying there's a thing as fate. I'm saying why give it one unnecessary level of complexity? If you're not going to hold God to the same standard, the reason you're saying a past infinite universe is impossible because eventually you get nowhere. But that's what would happen if you would actually follow the same logic with God. Well, there's a creation here on earth, which is already not fair to call this a creation. But if you're going to say it is and that creations require creators, then no problem. That would mean that some something with a higher mind than God would have been necessary to create God. If you're just going to stop, well, nope, God's the first cause. Why? He has all the same attributes as the problem with our universe. Where did he come from? How did he just appear? How has he always just been here? Why does he get to be outside of space and time? Why does he not have to have a beginning? Does it bug me? Sure, it bugs me because mysteries bug people. People want to find out the things we don't know. And I'm glad that that's part of human curiosity in nature because it's allowed us to figure out so much. What if we didn't have this desire to know? We'd still be stuck back thinking that Thor is the reason it thunders. That Poseidon is the reason the waves move. But we know better than that now. We understand weather. We understand lunar tides. Blindly filling a gap with mythology is not a better explanation for the unknown than just saying it's unknown. I don't know. I'm trying to answer your questions without being glib here. I honestly think you can't know any better than I do. Your book and your God are making claims that a thousand other books and a thousand other gods have made. They're trying to give some structure to how we got here, to how this all began, to where the universe came 
came from. You thinking that your one religion out of the multitudes is the correct one and has all the perfect answers, even though originally the creation story within this book is 100% combative to what science has found would have actually taken place. We may not know like what happened before the Big Bang, but we can track what happened since then. We can understand the order that things would have to happen in and the time frame that can be observed. And I believe we will continue to learn more and more and more. And as we've learned more and more and more, there has been less of a need to plug those gaps with God. But there's still a gap, and so people are still plugging it. Haven't we learned our lesson? Every single time thus far we have plugged a gap with God, it has not been needed. We know now that people get sick because of germ theory. We don't need God and God's enemies and demons to talk about a bad spirit for being sick. We've plugged the gap of weather by understanding our atmosphere, and we no longer need sun gods and moon gods and wind gods and storm gods. How can we not take all the data that we've understood and say there's an explanation that we couldn't figure out at one point that eventually we will figure out, or maybe we won't, but it won't mean that God did it because so far it never has meant that. It seems to me me like that's the desperate plea instead of just saying don't know there's probably an explanation and we'll probably find out if our technology continues to advance and we survive long enough as a species but maybe there is a governor out there a limiter of how much we can understand and absorb about the beginning of our universe it still wouldn't mean that god did it and specifically that the Christian God did it. I'm sorry, coming back to this, he actually had kind of a second question where he clarifies not just what is your typical response to it because he's heard them all, but doesn't it destabilize you a little bit when you're not in debate mode that we just don't know these things? And the answer is no, 100% not. And if that is the claim for religion, that it just stabilizes your uncertainty by filling a gap with no evidence whatsoever for that gap, you can have it, man. If it's that important for you and your security to know or to pretend that you know something. I actually believe that's why religion exists, is because we all needed to pretend like we knew when we didn't. It is a cure for existential dread. Are there times where I deal and struggle with the facts that we don't know what happens after we die? For sure. That I might not spend some happy eternity forever with my children? Yep, that sucks. But does it destabilize my life? Nope. It adds value to my life. It adds a ticking time bomb to my life. It adds the measure of me being more present to my life because as far as I know, without any reason to believe otherwise, this is it. This is all I get. This is my conscious experience and most likely when my brain dies, that conscious experience dies. I don't know that for sure and I'm open to being wrong about that, but until there's better evidence to tell me exactly what happens afterwards, I'm going to live this moment creating great meaning for myself, bettering the lives of the people around me and giving my children the best opportunity that they have to find success and happiness while alleviating suffering for other people from our blessed position. I can do all of that from a secular worldview, and again, it is not destabilized by what I don't know, but it is a catalyst because of what I don't know to live that way even better. Of the arguments for God's existence, is there one that to you seems more interesting than the rest? Is there one that for you actually does weigh in favor of theism? Which one? So he's been bouncing back and forth here between speaking about theism in general and Christianity. So he is asking this question about theism. Is there an argument out there for God, like the Kalam, which is more representative of a argument for a God, a first causer, than just say the Christian God? And if I'm being honest, some arguments are more compelling than others, but I do not believe there are any rock solid arguments out there for the existence or necessity of a God in the way that people typically think think of deities. These might be more like teleological or ontological arguments, but again, it's only raises the percentage point of how effective they are for God by a couple percent over some of the more, in my opinion, ridiculous ones like the moral argument or the watchmaker argument, things of this nature. If I thought there was a compelling argument for God, I'd probably at least be a deist of some sort. I consider myself an agnostic atheist because I believe there are no good arguments and that most of the arguments that people consider to be good are only good because they're untestable <laughs> because all of the other arguments that are testable for God have failed. And if they're untestable, that doesn't help because 
There's a ton of things that could fall into those categories. We could replace God at any time with a simulation or AI or significantly advanced technology or aliens. God is a placeholder for this intangible aspect of something that we think we might need to explain things we don't know. So again, very willing to say there could be a God, no particular reason so far to believe that there is. That includes there not being any arguments that I see to be particularly convincing. Most atheists I've met humbly admit that they don't think they can have absolute certainty about much of anything. But what they want from the Christian is a demonstration that God exists or that Christianity is true. Well, when we offer the reasons to believe that we do have, those are typically deemed not good enough. So what sort of evidence, if any, would be enough to convince you? Do you know? And since it's often a conversation stopper, let's take experimental reproducibility off the table, since that's not even always necessary for science. I mean, I do love that he just took off the table the best way of knowing anything to get reproducible results through an experiment that is also repeatable. Like that's typically when we can really get certain about something that we know. I just think there's a lot of outs baked into this. Like you're going to create a God that you're saying is more powerful than us that thinks in ways that are higher than our ways, that works in mysterious ways, like that's a pretty hard God to nail down. Do I think that anything could convince me? Absolutely. So much could convince me. What do I find about the Christian arguments for why they are convinced so uncompelling? Most of them come down to one of the few following things. A personal experience, which I won't cover in this particular video, why personal experience is not a good indicator of truth across the board because the Bible told me so, AKA using the source material and claiming that it's inerrant or perfectly valid or useful when there are enough things in that source material, again, that I think are married bachelors that are falsifiable, that have been proved to be incorrect, even giving context even giving metaphor. Divine revelation, that's gonna really fall into the personal experience camp. And then every once in a while you get the person who's convinced by the evidence. Well, the evidence for Jesus's resurrection is so compelling. Well, again, that evidence is coming from the book. So let me try to be more succinct. For me personally, not trying to prove it to everyone, I suppose personal experience would do the trick. It would need to be personal enough, though, that it conquers the other things that I would typically be able to attribute to psychologically, meaning that this God who knows me, who knows everything, should indeed know the thing that it would take for me to believe and then give it to me. If I'm going to go as far as believing that this God exists, I should be able to go as far as to believe that this God knows what it would take for me to believe that he exists, and that if he wants to have a relationship with me, and he is the one who made me, and he is the one who constructed me to think like this and need this level of evidence, that he would be willing to provide it if he means what he says about not wanting any to be lost. If that's too much of a stretch for that God, that's not my problem. The reliability of the Bible would have been the number one thing, though, that would have convinced me. And unfortunately, that's out the window. And that's just not my fault. I've read the Bible. I've studied the Bible. I have a major in Bible. I know too much about the Bible. I know too much about the claims the Bible makes and where it has failed to just believe that the Bible is valid. So I would need for somehow the Bible to change into something that is more congruent with who God claims to be and what we know about our world that he claims to have made. I just don't find anything convincing within the Bible. Even biblical prophecy fails massively. If God really wanted to utilize prophecy to show people that he was real, which should be the purpose of prophecy, right? Like otherwise then why do it? He could have done a billion times better. Let's get specific. Give me dates and times and names. The generic claims and the backpedaling used to make biblical prophecy work for you, I think are ridiculous. But again, that's a video for another day. Can something get me to believe that God is real? Yes. What would it be specifically? Probably him showing up and explaining the Bible to me. Would that then lead me to follow him? See my video from yesterday. It would highly depend on how he's able to explain to me that he's a good God. You know what? I'd have a better time believing that God is real if he showed up and just fessed up to it. I wanted to confuse people with the book. I don't care for everyone to come to heaven. I don't love everyone. Predestination is real. I let the devil hide dinosaur bones to confuse everyone with evolution. Like, I can get on board with that faster than I can get on board with all of the contradictory claims that the Bible makes about our superior being actually being those things all at once. So part of me kind of feels like, hey, it's not my job to know what would convince me. The fact of the matter is nothing has convinced me so far. And if this God really exists, that seems like it's on him. So God showing up and the Bible being accurate. Long story short. To what extent did social and moral issues start you down the path toward your atheism? 
That is to say, the typical Christian or religious views on sexuality, gender, rights, and acts and commands of God in the Old Testament. It seems that many deconversion stories online begin with, or at least include, LGBT issues, purity culture, or hell as instrumental in the deconversion process. It strikes me that what should matter most is the truth and not what we might prefer that the truth were. I honestly wonder how much those issues and ones like them motivate the deconversion rather than all this talk about evidence. It's a great question. Have heart issues or moral issues been at the root of my deconversion? Yes and no. I think that this deserves some clarification. If I had every reason to believe that the God of Abraham is real and I simply didn't like his character, that would not have been enough for me to stop believing in him. It might have been enough for me not to want to follow him. These are two different things. Again, I really think that yesterday's video is an important one for you guys to watch if you didn't, so you can get this basic understanding, especially for me moving forward with the channel as we cover content like this. They are two such totally separate things, but they can work together. For me, the first thing that fell was just recognizing all the things the Bible got wrong. So an evidence-based issue. That Noah's Ark can't actually be literally true. That the creation myth is false. That Adam and Eve cannot have existed. The age of the world and of the universe. Then it started to get into a little more philosophical issues like free will. And that did lead to some moral questions. Like if biblical free will has so many issues in it, then it can't really be a good excuse for the problem of evil or suffering anymore. And then you start looking at evil and suffering and you go through all the arguments there and you realize that even if the Bible is true, there might be some things you're morally calling into question when you look at the genocide and the forced rape and the slavery and and the abortionist punishment and the degradation of women and foreigners and homosexuals, etc. Yes, that plays a part, a big part, but not only in not liking this God, but in not being able to believe that this God is who he claims to be. Maybe a better way of saying this is I don't know what the probability difference is between this God not existing and this God not being a good God. Meaning if you said this God exists and he's just a monster, I would believe that faster than I believe that he exists and is the good God that we all claimed he was as good father and loving and forgiving, etc. And those are based off of the character claims of God and what the Bible says about God's character. So for me, waking up to issues like, wow, the Bible treats homosexuals horrendously, and if God is true, he would have made them this way, like, that's a problem, right? Slavery is something we all say is wrong, and supposedly we all have an objective morality from God, and if you need to see all of my videos on slavery, go for it, but it is clear that this God endorses and condones slavery. Not permitted, not regulated, not abolished, he endorsed it. He gave rule for it. He gave permission. It's disgusting. And the only way that it played a part in my deconversion is even if this God were real, I still would not follow him. But it had very little to do with my final conclusion that this God is not real. That was mainly due to the invalidity of the Bible. Can you name the last three academic books you read by theists on the subject? How long ago did you read them? Or is most of your understanding of apologetics and atheism from non-scholarly internet sources, pop-level books, and... Let's face it, YouTube videos. And be honest with yourself about this. Anyone can Google up a list of books and paste them in the comments section. But I want to know, are you getting the best from the other side? So this one's an easy one for me. Uh, I am a voracious reader. Many of you don't know that my first channel was Brandon's Bookshelf. I read anywhere from 100 to 150 books a year. I read with a high level of intent for understanding. I read mainly nonfiction. And my favorite topic to read about is theology and philosophy. So even though this feels a lot like a gotcha question. I read extensively on these subject matters from both aisles. It does get to a point where you hear the same argument so many times and you've really been able to come to an opinion that this is an issue for me and I have yet to hear another good argument for me. So do I go out and read and study every single book that has anything to say against the things I feel I may have already made up my mind about? Yeah, no, I don't do that. And neither does Braxton or neither does anyone else. Braxton, if you are not convinced right now of, say, Zeus being a real god, I would question how many books have you 
you read recently from Greek mythology just to make sure that you don't have it incorrectly or from the few scholars that still promote some idea of that mythology being correct? Are you checking in with them and keeping up on their newest articles or did you just make up your mind on this willy-nilly from some YouTube videos about how mythological it was in general or because it doesn't fit in with your current worldview and you feel you already know the evidence? Like, we can do this for anything. Asking people who say they don't believe in something, how much research did you do? I think it's the Christopher Hitchens quote that says that assertions without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And I really like that quote, even if I don't fully agree with it. I think if you're someone like me who is choosing to speak out about it, you better have a basis for doing so. But no one owes anyone an explanation of how many books they've read on the subject matter before they came to their conclusion. Especially for someone who's not making a positive assertion here, like you are, Braxton, that Christianity is true. You have a burden of proof, and we all know this, which is why I think you probably asked question two, is to try to get the atheist on board that's making a positive assertion so that they have to back it up. And that's all fine. But throwing out Google research or YouTube videos or hearing someone say something online, like, why are you online then, Braxton? I mean, do you think the only way to get qualified information is by reading the right people on the right subjects in the right media fashion? There's more information in someone's YouTube videos sometimes than there are in entire books or series. And there can be just as much good documentation and sources being listed, etc. in some of these videos. What I think you're really trying to say here, and I would hope this, is how much actual attention and care did you give this? I don't think how you came up with the information is necessarily important, as opposed to that you were using good information to make these decisions. I think it is hilarious for a Christian to posit that there's bad sources of information out there that have made people an atheist while they hold on to an ancient collection of fairy tales that they claim is divine truth. Your standards for scrutiny go out the window a little bit when you try to tell me about the inerrancy of the Bible. But I went to the bookshelf and I got my most recent read. Some of these will fit your categories and some of them won't. But I have J.L. Mackey's The Miracle of Theism, Arguments for and against God. I have St. Athanasius's On the Incarnation. This has a great introduction, by the way, from C.S. Lewis. I have Unbelievable by Justin Briley. This is why after 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. Oh, this one, um, this one is not that recent, actually, but this was Defeating Darwinism, uh, Beyond Opinion by Ravi Zacharias, which I have so much to say. And then I've reread within the last year, this one by Paul Copen, which is God, O Moral Monster. I am rereading it to really brush up on the defenses, especially as I've been going through my secular Bible study series. And then lastly, I read this one pretty recently by Francis Collins, The Language of God, where a scientist presents good evidence for belief. So again, maybe some of these don't count as scholarly as you would like, or maybe they're too old, or maybe they're too new, or maybe they're too fundamentalist, or maybe they're too progressive, or maybe they're too on the fence. There's always a reason why Christians don't like my reading, but I can tell you one thing. I've given it a fair shake, and I continue to. Now, are my motivations when I read some of these texts now different than they were a few years ago when I was really looking to them to answer this for me? Am I reading it with a higher level of skepticism? Certainly. But Braxton, I'm sure that's true for you if you read anything from the counter-apologetic side. So the last thing I'll say there is if you think I should be reading something even better than this by someone who is more scholar, by someone that is of a higher sense of reliability or whatever you want to say, bring it on. Show me the best. I want to read the best. I have an entire bookshelf over there. I've got a huge one here. And then that entire one is filled with both sides of the aisle because I want equal representation in this thing that I really have spent a large portion of my life believing and now defending the non-belief against it. Let's finish with a pretty common one. If you found out today to your satisfaction that Christianity were true, would you accept God's authority, repent of your sins, and trust Jesus as your king? Nope. Go ahead and see yesterday's video one more time so I can fully explain this to the nth degree. Here's the 30 second version. No, being forced to believe that the Christian God is real does not immediately alleviate all of the concerns I have about why I would not follow that God. And if you would blindly follow any deity simply because they've proven themselves to be the creator deity or because they are mightier than you, then your might makes right decision making is not a good way to do this. Is it good for self-preservation? Sure. And I can 
can only hope I would be consistent in my beliefs. I may not be. I may cower before the almighty God with the threat of hell looming over me and say, fine, your will be done. Let's do it. But to say that I would readily, willingly just want to follow this God based off what I know about this God, he'd have some explaining to do. And not in the Christopher Hitchens way of this God owes me a lot of explanations. Like, no, sincerely, God, if you're real, good Lord, holy cow, if you are actually real, if you are the one and you gave us this book and you mean the things you say in this book about wanting a connection, about being a good God, about being just, and about wanting to use me as a vessel via obedience to you and following your commands to further your work, then help me understand your work. I'll be the best damn missionary this world has ever seen if God does show up to me and convince me of his existence, and if he can help me understand his plan, his righteousness, his justice, his omnipotence, his will, his righteousness, because none of that makes sense to me. And it doesn't not make sense because I love my sin, and it doesn't not make sense because I chose not to read the Bible. It doesn't make sense because I read exactly what he gave us to read to do those things. God's word didn't do what it said it was going to do. So God, if you show up and you want me to do what you have asked of me to do and to follow you, you've got to help me understand it. I think that's a completely fair claim. In what other world would anyone ever say, hey, leave your family, leave your belongings, store up for yourself treasures in the next life. Don't worry about this one. It's the blink of an eye. Follow me. You don't have to understand my plan. In fact, you've read about my plan. You disagree with the plan. The plan sounds evil to you, but come along, come along anyways, and hurry up, hurry up, because if you don't, I'm going to burn you forever. Come on. Like, (laughs) it's so astronomically stupid and evil to me that no, I I would sure hope I wouldn't just jump at the chance to follow him simply because he exists. There are a billion people that exist that I would not follow simply because they are real. That has nothing to do with deserving worship, adoration, and discipleship. The fact that the Christian so easily conflates these two things together is just beyond fascinating to me. Looking back, I wish that I had prepared and really come up with specific answers for these because I think that I could do better in explaining myself. I would love to have a conversation about these topics because I think they are absolutely fascinating. And Braxton, if you do happen to see this and you want to pick an example of someone that has replied to you to have a conversation with, let's do it, man. But otherwise, I hope that this has been helpful to people on both sides of the aisle to better understand what certain individuals believe and how they're processing and making these decisions, etc. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. And until next time, keep thinking.